Good morning, everybody. My name is Agnès Forte. I'm working at EFSA in the Environmental and Ecotox Plant Unit since uh, 2000, uh, actually, it is since this year, but at EFSA since 2008. Um, so today is the session on knowledge and data information to help decision making relevant to pollinators. And I have the great pleasure uh, to um, announce uh, three uh, speakers. So we will have first uh, Noah Simon, who will present the EU Pollinator Hub Collective Platform Making Pollinator Related uh, Data Fair. Then we will have uh, Sarah Garavelli, who will present um, the role of EOSC in applying fair principles to research data. And then last but not least, Monica uh, Yatan, who will present how to do SAIO and environmental accounting help in pollinators health. And uh, with that, I uh, just want to give a really little uh, brief on uh, what we expect from this uh, session. So we know that there are several data-driven initiatives and research programs in Europe with the potential to support our understanding on pollinators' trends with the associated factors and threats that may affect them. And in this session in particular, we will discover how these initiatives follow the FAIR principles, meaning findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Now, I, we will start with um, the presentation by Noah. Um, we will have approximate, approximately 20 minutes for each speaker, followed by one or two questions for clarification. And then uh, at the end of the session, we will have time to uh, discuss further and uh, wrap up. So I just want uh, to introduce uh, Noah Simon, uh, although many people already know her. And so Noah Simon is a scientific director and project manager at BeLife since 2021. And over the past 14 years, she has provided scientific technical assistance to the European organization BeLife, following the evolution and implementation of European legislation on the subject of pesticide authorization agricultural and environmental policy. In more recent years, she has been involved in the implementation of data science to pollinators' health, while continuously providing technical assistance to Belgian and European beekeepers and decision makers. By training, she is a veterinarian and she holds a PhD in agricultural science and bioengineering from the University of Catholic de Louvain-la-Neuve in Belgium. And in her scientific career, Noah has specialized in environmental toxicology, particularly on bees, environmental policy, and honeybee health. So with that introduction, the, floors, the floor is yours, Noah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Agnes, for the introduction. So, Um, yeah, allow me to share my screen. Can you um, can you please tell me what you are seeing? It's the presenters mode. Eh? Very well. Okay, great. So thank you very much um, uh, for giving me the opportunity to present uh, this initiative, the European Pollinator Hub. That is a, it's a tool that we have been developing already for quite, uh, quite some years now. And uh, it aims to provide a collective approach to understand the pollinator trends and, and the health, and also to give a tool for, uh, to help decision making uh, at different levels. So, uh, but first, why why is it needed to have a pollinator hub? Um, so we, if we take into consideration that pollinators are environmental animals some, somehow, uh, then we um, that fly away and then in their flying um, around, they they get in contact with many different threats, many different contexts. Uh, so in order to understand what is happening with them, we really need to to have in mind this grid. 
let's say, of potential factors that can affect them, and then uh, to understand the interactions that uh, may appear, let's say, uh, and may uh, may be relevant in each context. No, not all the <laughs> so all the factors will affect them, but not all the factors are present in the same or with the same. Uh, uh, relative importance everywhere. Uh, so what we try to do uh, with this pollinator hub is to gather information uh, generated by anyone uh, in the field. So it could be authorities, it could be um, researchers, it could be beekeepers, it could be naturalists, it could be anyone uh, generating some pollinator related data, which is <laughs> actually very, very wide as uh, as concept bring these uh, all together and then try to have um, a view, so analyze it and interpret it so that we can get uh, an image about what is going on in the field. So the European Pollinator Hub at the end, it's just an infrastructure that allows different users to bring observations together. Uh, but of course, each of us have a different way of collecting observations and data. So uh, what we uh, we try to do is to standardize uh, all this data in the way that it is uh, it can be comparable. And of course, not all the observations that uh, that are taken um, are taken with the same quality. Let's say, or I mean, the quality of the of the gathering of the collection of data is one thing. And then afterwards, it is a matter of the quality of transferring, of uh, communicating this data. So what we also do in the, in the Pollinator Hub is to do a quality check and a data curation uh, so that uh, the, the data that is used can be, uh, yeah, can be reused, let's say, afterwards. Then uh, what we also try to do is to, to do a, to transform this raw data into valuable information that helps for decision making at different level. Uh, it can be for uh, decision making at field uh, level, it could be decision making at local level or even at European level. And uh, yeah, because the most important actually uh, is to, to make sense of all this data. So to transform the data into information that can be consumed to do something else. And uh, as I said, uh, because pollinators are a mother of all of us, and there are a lot of people involved into gathering the little pieces of the puzzle. So what we try to do is to have a collective approach to, to this, to create actually a community uh, that is contributing to, to get a, a better picture about the whole situation. So, and a little bit of the history, as I said, that we have been developing this for, for some years now. So we divided the development into several phases. Uh, the first one was a proof of concept. This we did it thanks to a, to a project that uh, we were part of. And then afterwards, the, the prototype and the, oper the operational platform have been supported by the, the EFSA. Uh, in all these development, uh, we have had always the as a steering committee the European Bee Partnership that is a, a group of stakeholders uh, moderated by EFSA, uh, bringing together researchers and academia, uh, people from the field, so beekeepers, farmers, veterinarians, uh, industry as well, environmental NGOs and institutions. And the idea is that all these people also contribute to to bring their data, their own observations, and their own needs also into the platform. So something that is, I said, very, very important is actually uh, to standardize the data and to peer review it. Uh, so the data can be really of quality and can be reused. Many different data coming from different sources arrive. So we have scientific data, institutional data, uh, industry data, beekeepers data, each, each of them, or farmers data. Each of these collectives are generating data for their own purposes, okay? With their own standards, uh, quality standards, etc. And what we do in the hub is that we pass this through a filter and afterwards uh, we obtain data that can be reusable and can be uh, interoperable by other, but whoever wants to use it. 
And so here is where it come the, the fair principles, let's say. Um, so how are we doing this? So how is the hub making it findable? Well, in the in the in the platform, we are going to so we we integrate a data searching tool, uh, in which uh, so we have done a categorization of terms uh, and we have the terms that are available in a dictionary. A, a dictionary has been created for the standardization for standardization purposes, and uh, it is also um, community driven. Let's say um, so. There is this data searching tool. So whoever is interested about getting some kind of data, then we just look for the data and then we see if the data is available in the hub. We will also have a, a European uh, pollinator hub data map. So this is a map in which uh, of Europe, let's say, and then we can see what kind of information exists in each of the places, uh, yeah, each of the places of Europe. So, um, I mean, and this we can say, uh, it is a European effort, of course, because it has been supported with the European funds, but eventually the infrastructure is, uh, it can be valid for anyone, let's say, or, or for any other data that eventually would like to be put in. So eventually uh, this platform could have the potential to be the world uh, pollinator hub, I don't know. Uh, it is just a matter of who would like to contribute with the data uh, in, in the hub. How are we making it accessible? Uh, well, in the hub, we process the data. Uh, and of course, uh, because we want to transform this data into, um, yeah, into information. So for this, we, we process and analyze the data. So all the process data and even the code of the, um, of the hub are open source. So uh, let's say, yeah, anyone can have access to that. Uh, and then, Afterwards, the data providers, because we have this, um, let's say, this image of a data provider, um, the data provider is the one that contributes with their own data into the platform. Uh, and they are the ones that decide if they want to share their data openly or not, and how they want the, their data to be uh, referenced. So what kind of license they want to use in their data. So let's say here we have two difference. The, the accessibility of the process data of the hub, it is openly available, let's say it's accessible. The data provided by the data providers, it really depends on uh, the data provider will to make it accessible or not. So, but yeah, the, the hub, uh, let's say, just provides the, the possibility to, to have this control over the data that is put there. How are we making it interoperable? Well, we are having a, an API, it's a, an a, automatic uh, programming interface uh, that uh, the people can uh, link, let's say, so the data in the platform can be, in, uh, let's say, uh, exchanged with whatever other platform that is out there for the process data, as I said. And uh, we also have a development service for APIs and interfaces uh, because in many occasions, we are also, so the hub is also connecting with other servers via APIs uh, so that there is a, a permanent fluid of, uh, of data, okay? So we try to, to have, for instance, this connection from platforms to the hub and from the hub to platforms. And then if there is a need to develop something, then we can also do it. And then finally, how are we making it reusable? Uh, how are we making the data re reusable, let's say? So there is all the, uh, everything is documented in the hub. So the whole process is documented. So uh, everybody who is interested has accessibility to all the methodologies that are used for the curation, for the data uploading, everything. The data that is included into the, into the hub, as I said, it passes is by a quality check and a peer review process in which we check that uh, the metadata of the data is there, let's say. So uh, everything is super well documented uh, for anyone to reuse it. Uh, as I said, it passes by a standardization process. So the data that is there, there is, it has been standardized and everything is explained how it was standardized. And um, yeah, and then we have this, these quality checks. And because uh, it was very important to, that the data is comparable, uh, so we have also developed this standardization to tool that is the dictionary. 
uh, in which, uh, as I said, uh, it is a collective approach. So we are already collaborating with the, the, the Apimondia um, BXML group. This is um, a group of experts that are trying to propose a, a, a dictionary of standardized terms for beekeeping, uh, let's say beekeeping and, and bee related uh, terminology. So this is a collective tool to work on definitions, on uh, parameters, etc. And uh, and yeah, like we work collectively to 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 get these terms, uh, so that anyone can use them, translate them, etc. But of course, we also use other. We have also used some other um, third party, let's say, um, standardized terminology that ISO or taxonomical data, etc. Um, so for us, uh, we go a little bit beyond the data sharing because, uh, okay, so data sharing is one thing and it's, it's, let's say um, to, to get the data is good, but we also uh, we also observe that at least into our sector, uh, it was very important to provide also the analytical services to society because the pollinator is a very, very niche uh, environment, let's say, and it is very difficult to interpret the data. And um, so we are actually providing these uh, interpretation services somehow or uh, collecting um, the good development that other people have done in interpreting this data. So we include it here and we give visibility to this. So for us, it's really a, a democratization tool, let's say, uh, for to understand pollinator related data uh, for decision making, daily decision making. And here I would like just to explain you like some uses that we have, because as I said, one thing is the, the data provision and gathering, the standardization and everything, and then what to do with this data. So for instance, we can uh, change and we do uh, some, um, some of these uh, relationship graphs in which we put, okay, which uh, pollinators are visiting which plants, for instance, or the number in the beekeeping sector. So the, the evolution of varroa, varroa is a, para, is a parasite of, uh, of honeybees. So we can actually show uh, yeah, the evolution in different years, the variability of varroa. We can also put some epidemiological maps of uh, some specific diseases related to pollinators in, in certain regions. Or we also have some uh, interacting tools so people can play with the data because I think it's very important to, to potentiate the curiosity, let's say, in the people to, to explore the data. Um, yeah, or even uh, this is another example in which, for instance, we have um, the data from uh, scales. Uh, scales that are put on uh, on colonies uh, all over Slovenia, and then you can play with the data to see, okay, uh, which parameters are checking. Okay, maybe it is net weight, maybe it is the whole year uh, collection of uh, of honey. Uh, then you can yeah just select the year. You can select the areas as you see. Like it is the idea is that the user at the end once they put the data here. Uh, they can explore, the, the data provider can explore its own data because this is kind of a service that we provide, but then that this data can also be uh, explored by other people uh, in, in a way that is understandable. And then, so what's next? Uh, so we are doing a lot of uh, training sessions um, so how to use it, how to upload the data, how to use a dictionary. And the next two ones are uh, about using the data that is in the hub and to getting the best out of uh, our own data, let's say, in the hub. So I really invite you to, to register to these, um, to these training sessions because they are very interesting and they, they are very uh, educative uh, and, and, and interactive, let's say. And just to remind that the, the Pollinator Hub, it is now under development, so we are testing everything, but it will go live uh, in March, most likely in March next year. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. I don't know if, uh, Agnes, do I have a little bit um, time? I just wanted to show how it looks. Yes, please, Noah. Okay, so uh, I don't know what I'm saying, so just a minute. Because I don't see. 
Okay. So what we have um, is a, a presentation. Uh, so if anyone wants to go into the into the website, there is a presentation interface where we explain a little bit more about what what is it about, a little video on everything, what kind of um, of um, of services can be provided. Let's say what is the whole logic uh, of the of the of the collective approach. Let's say. And so the kind of things that uh, that we develop and then so when we become a data provider for instance we want to collaborate with the with the initiative then we end up in the in the application uh, in which we can uh, so start for instance using the dictionary participating to the to the translator to the proposal of definitions terminology etc and then we can also share data so here you can see, for instance, the amount of data that I have contributed with. Uh, so here you see, like, of course, <laughs> we are part of the development, so we, we contribute a lot. Um, and then, so we, because we know that people work in teams and mainly for research projects, for instance, that's very important. So we can create different teams. Um, uh, and then in the team, so for instance, here I have two teams for two projects that uh, we collaborate. So we have a, we can have our own team environment, and we can include here the the databases of the different projects uh, that are only we can make that they are only available to our team to our group, uh, and then whenever we decide as data providers that these data can go live, uh, and then the embargo can can be removed, then that's it. Then uh, we can make it public to everybody. So we are trying to make it, um, yeah, to make it uh, as user friendly as possible. Let's say so. If uh, if you have other, I mean, here for instance, I have also my own uh, data for my. So I, I have one data set that I only wanted me to include it here. So for instance, here it's only myself putting this as a data provider, but that's okay. You know, so this different. We can actually use it as person, as a team or as a project or, yeah. And uh, so with this, I would like to finish my contribution. Thanks. Thank you very much, Noah. That was very interesting. And uh, I think we can uh, yeah explore further uh, at the data providers uh, when they want to submit data. Um, probably they can yes uh, with the email to you. Uh, they, they can yes with you and uh, see how the, how can this be arranged through this create new data set but talking about um, end users um in, in finally who would be the end users of this uh, operational platform uh, sorry i'm just trying to come back <laughs> to you because i don't know where where it went anyway um so the end users uh, for us uh, is different uh, they have, uh, they can be uh, people. So we have different profile of users. The um, the users that can, uh, let's say, the, the people that are just curious to know what is happening for pollinate with pollinators, and then uh, so these people can just go into the into the platform and play a little bit with the data, and then that's it. Then there are people who want to go. Uh, who need a little bit more. They need to have a little more in-depth uh, information. So for this, they already need to register into the platform and then they can start uh, interacting much more with the data. And they can then they have the possibility to, to do uh, different visualizations, different uh, reporting. Uh, yeah, they have other tools, let's say, to, to, to go a little bit farther into the consumption of information, if we can say. Uh, then we also have as users, the people who want to share their data. And, um, and these are the data providers. And in the data providers, we have a very, very different profiles. So we can have, for instance, people that, um, people that are uh, scientists, for instance, data scientists. So then they can, uh, put there, they are very, very knowledgeable about what to do with their data. They can analyze their own data. So for them, 
uh, we are just providing a tool that is helping them standardizing their data, giving it a, a, a way, peer reviewing their data, let's say, and also give um, uh, helping them to to format the data into a reusable format. But then we also have um, people that are maybe citizens that are collecting data because they are curious, I don't know, or, or because they are beekeepers who have uh, scales or things like this. But afterwards, they do not know what to do with their data. Or beekeeping associations, for instance. They are collecting a lot of information from the field and they don't know how to analyze this because they don't have competency in statistics or whatever. So in this case, uh, the, the, the hub provides them with um, some uh, possibilities to process and visualize their data. Okay. I and, think that's, uh, yeah. Yeah, that's, the, the, there are multiple uh, end users, uh, as I can see, and, and, and that's very rich and uh, good to hear. There is a question in the chat that I would like to raise. Uh, will there be a pollinator hub in Asia? And that's from uh, Christian Bonillo. Uh, well, I don't know. We are in contact with the FAO, uh, actually, for because uh, I know that the, the FAO wanted to, to propose these kind of platforms in different continents. So we said, like, please don't reinvent the wheel. Like, we have already put a lot of effort into this and the, the, um, the, the structure of the, let, let's say, or the infrastructure can, can be the same one. Uh, so it is just a matter of uh, using the same thing and then adding data coming from different data providers. So it is it is just a matter of using it. If it is called the EU Pollinator Hub or the Pollinator Hub or whatever, it, it doesn't matter. Uh, but this is something that we are exploring. And of course, there could be a, an Asian Pollinator Hub. Uh, and we certainly are completely in for... Uh, the, this tool to be used as much as possible, no matter where. Okay, thank you, Noah. I think it's also a matter of collaboration, strengthening our collaboration. Would you be kind enough to answer in the in the type uh, type answer to the to the person while we go to the next speaker? This sure. is for recording purpose. Thank you, Noah. With that, uh, I think we should move. And I would like to introduce uh, Sara Garavelli, who is from EOSC. Um, Sara Garave Garavelli is a Strategic European Engagement and Coordination Development Manager at the Finnish IT Center for Science, also known as CSC. She is a member of the Board of Directors of the European Open Science Cloud Association, at national level, Sarah coordinates the European Open Science Cloud Finnish Forum, supported by the Finnish Ministry of Education and Culture. She has more than 10 years of experience in the areas of stakeholder engagement, outreach, and international collaboration in the research infrastructure landscape. Saha has a degree in telecommunications, engineering, and a master degree in logistics and organization for industry and commerce. So uh, with that, I give you the floor, Saha. Thank you. Thank you very much, Agnes, for the extensive presentation. Uh, I think, Noah, you need to stop sh sharing yes. your screen. <laughs> I, this is, uh, so <laughs> can you please start sharing yours? Because... I, I somehow I hide the, the control panel and now I cannot find it again. I'm sorry, I have been trying to do it. It's the first okay. time that this has ever happened to me. I don't know what is happening. Okay, but it tells me that I cannot start the screen share while the other participant is sharing. So okay. I'm sorry for this. Yeah, I think, uh, but I think if you click on the Zoom icon on your uh, computer, you should be able to retrieve the screen. Uh, that's the thing that I cannot do that, and I don't know why. <laughs> Look, the only thing I can do is uh, an opportunity. Andres, maybe. can you please help? Because I really maybe. don't. Well, maybe you leave and you come back in one minute, and then uh, we. I don't know. Maybe if you find another. Ah, now okay. sorry. Oh, yeah, now I, I can take control of the screen now i'm sorry for this sarah oh no worries. uh can you see my presentation properly yes 
we can okay thank you okay so good morning everyone and thank you very much for inviting the EOSC the European Open Science Cloud to give a presentation and I want to start congratulating Noah and all the other organizations that have contributed to the Pollinator Hub because uh, well you did the, I mean that's exactly the type of effort that EOSC is is encouraging and now you will see uh, after no presentation that there are many links to what I'm presenting right now. So I've been asked to introduce the European Open Science Cloud or EOSC as we call it uh, briefly uh, to, to this community and that's what I'm gonna tell you in this presentation and I also will uh, tell you a bit about the work that we are doing when it comes to FAIR principles that Agnes also introduced before. Okay, I wanted to start with this presentation contextualizing why there is an European Open Science Cloud, and this goes back to the European strategy for data. And I want to start with this statement that the value of data lies in its use and reuse. And that's exactly what I've seen Noah trying to explain before when it comes to the pollinator hub. So that's really one of the main principles also behind the European Open Science Cloud. So research data need to integrate with other data and interoperate with application or workflows. And also the overall research domain is very dynamic and heterogeneous environment as we have already heard. So really there is the need to generate added value from the resources that are today available. And this is one of the main um, objectives of EOSC. So we need to start uh, stopping doing um, double effort in collecting data in analyzing data. So once uh, the collection is done, we really need to reuse as much as possible and generate added value from this data. And the second point is really to break down silos and broker across borders and disciplines. So data coming from different disciplines can be reused and of value in other contexts and domains. That's one why uh, the European Open Science Cloud initiative was created. So it's a European initiative, uh, but uh, also in this context, okay, this is focusing on Europe, but there are other, let's say, commons that are appearing also in other continents. So indeed, we are focusing on the European area, but, but uh, always collaborating also with other continents. The purpose, we say, is to build this European web of fair data and related services for research. What does that mean? We want to enable that research data is easy to find, access, interoperate, and reuse. They are the fair principle. But also that the research outputs are sustainable and trusted and at disposal of all the disciplines. This is why EOSC has three main objectives. The first one is really to make sure that open science practices and also skills are rewarded and thought becoming the new normal. The second objective is about standardization. And we heard this also in Noah's uh, presentation. So we really need to make things interoperable. So select the proper standards and work in that direction. And the third objective is a more, how do we do that from a technical perspective? And the idea behind the EOSC is to establish this federation of existing infrastructures. So EOSC is not creating any new digital platform. So we are not building a, a new, for example, pollinator hub, but we are trying to connect existing infrastructures to make sure that data are easily accessible, findable, and reusable, and not just data, but also services. I just put on the slide the link that you can uh, uh, check later on. The research, EOSC is based on a strategic research and innovation agenda where you can read what are the priorities uh, uh, for the next years. Uh, so why EOSC then? So what we want to try and do is really to enhance scientific research, providing access to data and research outputs from different fields or institutions. Foster innovation. So clearly, we strongly believe that sharing, collaborating uh, on data and research will uh, uh, improve European com uh, competitiveness, improve transparency and reproducibility, 
and also reduce data silos and duplication of effort. This is also very, very important. Uh, finally, one other key aspect of EOS is really to facilitate interdisciplinarity. So let's remember that data from a certain domain can also be reused by another uh, domain, and science is more and more global. Uh, just to give you a bit of context and history of what happened so far and where we are at the moment. So the EOSC vision uh, came, let's say, in the European landscape in 2016, when there was uh, the European Cloud Initiative launch. There was uh, uh, an EOSC roadmap prepared, and there was a lot of work uh, to gain political support. Uh, for example, EOSC is mentioned in the Council conclusion in 2018. Uh, but also most recently in 2021. So EOSC has been recognized by the Council of the European Union as action number one of the policy agenda for the European research area. And this policy action has been endorsed by more than 24 countries so far. So 24 countries in Europe have committed to have EOSC as priority number one, meaning facilitating the sharing of and verification of data and services. Uh, the European Commission has been uh, dedicating some funding for starting the implementation of EOSC. And when I'm talking about implementation of EOSC, we are talking more about, uh, uh, from one side, working on fair practices and making sure that communities are aware of the fair principles, they know how to deal with the fair principles, and they work on some use cases. And on the other side, there is the aspect of the federation. And when it comes to the federation of European infrastructure, research infrastructure, data infrastructures, there have been some work on prototyping at the moment. And uh, recently, we had the first procurement issued by the European Commission uh, in order to have a system, an operational system in place by 2024. So I think that this presentation is very timely because from January on, you will see something that is officially an EOSC product to start the federation. I just wanted to highlight also a governance related aspects so you can understand a bit how the initiative is organized. So in 2021, EOSC becomes a co-program partnership. So that's the governance instrument. And in order to have a co-program partnership, you need to have a legal entity uh, that signs a memorandum of understanding with the European Commission. The EOSC Association is that legal entity. And today I'm representing the EOSC Association and the EOSC Association in the EOSC context represents the voice of the community. Over 260 organizations in Europe, and we are talking about a research performing organization, research funding organizations, service providers, universities, they have joined the association and they also have mobilized more than 400 experts working on different priorities in the EOSC area. And when I'm talking about priorities, so clearly we talk about fair practices, but also we talk about persistent identifiers, we talk about metadata and ontologies, so the, that's the, the idea. Uh, when it comes to the co-program partnership, I said before that uh, there is uh, the mechanism is a true memorandum of understanding between the EOSC Association, and you see some names there. We have a president, a secretary general, and a board of directors that are steering the strategy. And then there is a general assembly with the representation of all the members. And then there is the European Commission. In this case, we have a double representation from DG RTD, Research and Innovation, and DG Connect, the, the more infrastructure related units. And in all of this, uh, we also have the engagement of the member states, which is really important because, uh, as we know, there are many initiatives also at national level collecting data, working on data infrastructures, and so on. So you see that. Uh, in the governance, we are trying to put together all the relevant actors in the decision making, the community represented by the association, member states, European Commission. But let's go a little bit in the details uh, about why the fair principle are so at the foundation of EOSC. And I just put here a couple of uh, 
uh, let's say, reasons that we felt over the years. That's why we need to focus on fair data. There is a study that probably you are aware of. Uh, it's called the cost of not having fair da research data uh, by uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. And from that study, it emerged that the cost is, is, uh, of not having fair data is estimated about uh, uh, being about 10.2 billion euro per year, only for Europe. So this is already a very good reason to work on, on fair data. But the other point that I want to uh, highlight for you is also there was a, this um, uh, declaration uh, right after the coronavirus crisis. And uh, during that crisis, it was highlighted even more and more how much pressure there is on the research community to speed up scientific dis discovery and also how much this depends on the ability to quickly find and integrate different data types. So this was really at the heart of finding quick responses for the coronavirus crisis. So these two motivations, one societal, the other one financial, are really the strong triggers behind the YOSC uh, initiative. In terms of activities that uh, we are doing or enabling in the EOSC landscape, so there was a study from the European Commission, commissioned by the European Commission on the European research data um, landscape. And uh, this study still highlighted that, that uh, fair principle, there is still a lack of awareness of fair principles in the communities. There is uh, a lot of work to do still in the that direction. That's why YOSC is trying to support, uh, for example, core assessment criteria for fairness. There are different uh, uh, maturity models uh, developed and recommendations. So we are trying to, uh, let's say, have a forum for discussion and possibly evolution on, on that topic. Fair assessment tools, that's another uh, very important topic. There are different tools developed by different organizations or communities, and still we need to find convergence. And so which tools are we trusting? Which is the one that give us exactly the answer? Well, this is fair, this is not fair. This is still an area that requires a lot of work. Uh, we talk about fair implementation profiles, but also use cases, especially when it comes to interoperability framework. So we consider the FAIR principle as main enablers for interoperability. FAIR activities are national and institutional level. I already said that before, and that's why member states need to be engaged, but also institutions. And in the EOS context, we are also trying to uh, advocate that, uh, uh, I mean, FAIR activities might come with a cost. And this should be a cost that the institution need to support. It's not up just to the final researcher or the end uh, user uh, to sustain that cost. Uh, there is work on policy papers, and that's again where the member states are really heavily engaged. And uh, uh, through the European Commission funding, several uh, fair thematic demonstrators are encouraged and I just want to give you an example here and I just took this slide from the European Commission so after during the COVID one of the main initiatives launched by under the ESC umbrella was this European COVID-19 data portal and uh, I mean it's very similar to the concept that Noah presented before right so the need there was to put together data sets coming from different countries and you know better than me that when it comes to uh, health related data there are issues with GDPR different regulations and so on so this took a lot of time but then this first European COVID-19 data portal was formed and it was really supporting uh, all the analysis uh, uh, for when it came to, to COVID-19. This portal now was also the trigger for launching a new pathogen portal in July 2023 that contains more than 200,000 pathogen species and strains. So this is exactly an example of what EOS would like to encourage. And these data now are accessible for scientists, healthcare, public health professionals to collaborate and uh, support research in the area. 
Uh, the approach of this fair demonstrator mainly comes under three uh, areas. So one area is usually is making fair data reality within the community. As I said before, still a lot of work needs to be done in the communities to adopt common fair data policies. Metadata and, and data stewardship with the community. That's also a very another very important point. And also adoption of common templates for data management plans. We have noticed that data management plans are more and more common, so they are becoming a sort of a practice, but sometimes uh, people deliver the data management plan and it's there and nobody is really curating the data management plan. So the data management plan should be an instrument um, that is uh, an, an iterative uh, process. The second approach is more the one uh, from the perspective of the services for scientific data. So it's not enough to have fair data, but we need uh, fair data discovery and access service. We need, uh, we call them virtual research environment, but this is very similar to what I've seen in Noah's presentation about you have these teams in the uh, pollinator hub where different uh, researchers can do work together in a virtual environment. That's exactly the same concept. And to do research, data is one aspect, but maybe you need other facilities like computing, storage, or specific services and that's why all this part also about analytical services is there and finally let's say the 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 general idea of the um, fair demonstrators in the EOS context is to connect them to the EOSC federation what does it mean it means that if i have an environment like the covid-19 data portal or the pathogen portal or the pollinator hub i would like that uh, people that are accessing those data, maybe they need data from climate or they need to combine data from social sciences. So they will be able through the federation to access different type of data and reuse different type of services that are already available in different communities. Um, and I just put here one slide on the federation. I'm not gonna go into technicalities, but this is, just to say that uh, or reiterate the concept that EOSC is not planning to invent a new infrastructure or a new data repositories. It's really about connecting existing system that we call nodes. And uh, each of these nodes should make available for the Federation fair data and services or fair data or services. So there are different ways to be interconnected in the, in the Federation. And clearly, the main objective is that this should, uh, uh, let's say, overcome the barrier of the thematic and geographical boundaries. As I mentioned at the beginning, so the first EOSC node will be operational in 2024, and will act as a bit as a blueprint for the other nodes. We are still discussing in the community who can be a node. So the question, for example, for this community could be, is the uh, pollinator hub a node? Maybe, I don't have the answer today, but that's exactly what we are figuring out in the next month. Uh, I just wanted to close my presentation just with uh, some parallels and just to pass the message. So is EOSC and the pollinators two different words where as you already understood from what I said so far, the answer is clearly no. And I just wanted to give you an example example of a project that is uh, running in the EOS context. And this, uh, this project is called Biodiversity Digital Twin, and I just put the, the link there. So the idea is that this project is basically uh, putting together a honeybee pollination digital twin with the purpose uh, at the start, uh, at least to produce a map for Germany that can be used to assess the quality of the landscape for honeybee vitality and productivity given the environmental and beekeeping management scenarios uh, with the idea of extending this uh, to other countries if successful. So how is this project contributing to EOSC or connected to EOSC? So for example, the data that is used in the digital twin are some of them are stored locally, some others are coming from the weather data streaming from the German weather forecast. So in the future, the idea is that EOS can facilitate data access and harmonization. So we heard before how difficult it is to harmonize data from different data sources. Having a data federation at European level should help or should make a step further 
in being able to access data coming from different initiatives. Uh, different simulation models are also available. So this project is using one, but there are others. The idea of making available or making discoverable resources is also not just about data and services, but also about models. The resulting workflow in this case will be published on a GitHub. So that's also a good practice in terms of reusability of code and uh, software. And metadata description in this case will be developed as raw crates. There are other uh, communities in that, that sense, but that's really the, the point, to make available metadata description as much as possible. And finally, as I said before, the aspect linked to the Federation is that the generated data could become part of the EOSC Federation and thus being reusable also in other domains. Uh, and I... So this is just one example. And my message here for you today is that other contributions are really welcome. So it, that's EOSC is a collective effort. So we need everyone on board. Uh, concluding, uh, so EOSC is a federated initiative really promoting the production and reuse of research data. Uh, the idea is that EOSC can help researchers to manage and make their data fair and here, the concept of the new generated data that can be easily discovered and reused. EOS provides a platform for sharing and integrate data. And again, I just want to reiterate the concept that is not about building a new platform to collect data, but connecting existing platforms that are already facilitating the sharing and integration of data. Uh, fostering discipline, interdisciplinary collaboration. And also EOSC will help coordinate access to resources like computing, storage, data repositories, and, and so on. Uh, aligning practices and standards for high quality fair data. And finally, we'll continue to advocate for open science becoming the new normal. So that's my uh, final slide. I just wanted to close with an announcement. So if you want to understand more about EOSC or become part of the community, we have the EOSC annual event. Uh, this year is going to be in Berlin, uh, 21, 23rd of October. So soon we are opening registration and uh, we will publish all the details. So that's, uh, I just wanted to uh, let you know about this opportunity for engagement. And that's all from my side. I think I will stop sharing. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Sarah. Very uh, interesting and very rich. Um, I have a question. If I, I don't see any question in the chat um, regarding, so you, you mentioned the COVID-19 as an example, um, and, and you open um, in, in concluding that, you know, any, any, any research project, any person interested could uh, liaise with you to share the data. However, uh, I guess it, it it has to be limited, uh, so I, I, I don't know. I'm just wondering, uh, in terms of interest, um, how do you select? Uh, because you have to select, you have to prioritize, I guess, among all the possible um, avenues, opportunities that would be offered to you. So um, how do you select the research project and how do you interact uh, to, to make uh, the process uh, smooth? And, and efficient. Yeah, so thanks Thanks for the question. So indeed, I think that there are two different aspects uh, when it comes to who can contribute and how. So as I said before, in 2024, we will have a first European node, okay? This European node will be owned by the commission. And the idea is that this European node will be the one uh, for example, providing the functionalities for the federation with other nodes. And I'll give you an example. If I am uh, part of a research infrastructure, okay, my research infrastructure maybe could be one other node in a specific thematic domain. So what we have to do is really to find the technicalities, but also the legal framework to interconnect in the federation. Once we are connected, it means that uh, uh, end users that are entering the European node, 
for example, can see the resources that are available in the research infrastructure. And we are not changing the policy, the existing policies of the research infrastructure. So if the research infrastructure says that certain users can use their data or services, this will remain the same, okay? So it's not about changing policies or enforcing new, new policies, but it re is really to give a seamless access to different resources so that the, use, the end user have, uh, as let's say, a broader portfolio to navigate. So that's one option. Because the first node comes from the European Commission, they thought, okay, when we start, we should also equip the node with some resources. Otherwise, we have an empty node, right? And that's why the European Commission will also make available some resources that end users, also those working in a research project, can request access to. So there will be some services like uh, file transfer facilities, uh, computing uh, container, Jupyter notebooks uh, that can be freely used by end users users and research projects. So summarizing, I think that the idea is that, so there is no selection from, let's say, the, um, the federation perspective, but clearly the resources available, it depends on the nodes joining the federation. And that's why I was saying before, uh, so I don't know what is the governance structure of the pollinator hub. Uh, because at the moment, the discussion is that each node of the federation should have uh, a legal representative okay so you need a legal representative and why is that because we need to ensure quality quality and we need to ensure that the services are provided in the in the way they should be so if there is a, if someone for example in the context of the pollinator if you have a legal entity the pollinator hub for example could be one of the node so you will be part of the federation and this means that researchers in Europe, may, maybe they, if they access the European node, they will discover the EU pollinator and they will come to you, okay? So it's not that we are transferring any of your data in a centralized system in Europe. So the data and the resources remain there. So it's more a way to uh, increase the discoverability of these resources. And the same applies, for example, for the infrastructure at national level. It's not the idea is not to encourage researchers at national level that are already served by some research infrastructure to go to a central European point. But if the national infrastructure is part of the federation, the researchers at national level will see and discover other resources, data on services. So we are not changing the entry point, but we are are enriching the entry points with other uh, resources. So that's uh, the idea. Okay, no, that's very, very clear. Thank you very much, Sarah. I think Noah wants to also uh, join in. And you have a comment, a question? I, I had a question, actually. Uh, yeah, thank you, Sarah. So I, because you said that the, um, the member states, they have engaged to the EOSC also, and uh, they have engaged in making their, their data fair. And uh, so I would like to ask you, so it is the member state as institution, let's say, so it's all the, the ministries, etc. cetera. And uh, does this means that the official public data uh, is supposed to be fair? You know, like all, all the, um, there are plenty of monitoring uh, programs and, and data collection by the ministries uh, of completely different topics or so health, yeah. agriculture, industry, whatever. Uh, and actually, we have been looking for some of these and it is very difficult to, to access it. So that's why... Um, I was very interested to to hear this because I, I don't know how this engagement is translated in practice. Yeah, thanks thanks for the question. So indeed, uh, the persons that are engaged in the governance uh, of EOSC from the member states, we are talking about representatives coming from the ministries, usually education, culture, science, uh, also economics, uh, in depending on how, uh, I mean, where EOSC is positioned in the different uh, countries at ministry level. Uh, the idea is that, for as I said, there is uh, at least 24 countries that uh, are endorsing uh, 
uh, this uh, EOSC action uh, as action of the European Research Area. What does it mean? It means that usually these are the countries that they have in place a national fair policy. Not all the countries are there yet. Uh, the specificity of how this translates in the country, it's different from country to country. So it's not that this policy is dictating uh, uh, standard rules for all the countries. That's not what it says, but uh, it shows a commitment from the country that can be translated in different type of actions. I'll give you an example. My country, Finland, where we recently published a policy for fair. So which means that we are, uh, we have, for example, national level, a project on uh, DMPs, uh, where we bring together all the national stakeholders, universities, uh, research center, we are working on automating as much as possible data management plans. So, and this is an example on how to translate the policy in a practical uh, tool that will be used at national level. But it doesn't mean by default that all the data, uh, public data for the countries is going to be fair or accessible, at least not in the short term. So this is exactly what EOSC um, wants to do. And the idea of having uh, this first node owned by the Commission, it's also because the Commission would like to make accessible through the EOSC the public data that they are in control for. For example, the uh, OPER, um, the ORE platform, the OPER research uh, platform is this is a publishing platform launched by the Commission a couple of years ago. This will be integrated, okay? Uh, CORDIS. CORDIS is a source of information for different projects. That also will be integrated, and that's public data. So when it comes to the more uh, discipline-specific, I think that a lot of uh, uh, responsibility is going to be put on the research infrastructures, because they are the ones that so far have organized the type of knowledge. But, but yeah, so I would say that uh, EOSC is... Uh, advocating and encouraging uh, this, but it's not a direct translation that, okay, if I support the policy, my, all my data are fair or public accessible. I don't know, Noah, if I answered your your question. Okay. Okay. Um, we have a question, a hand raised from uh, the attendees. So, Marcin Grabowski, please, uh, would you like to... Would, would you like to um, would you like to talk? You are muted. Okay, I think we should go ahead. Just one second. Apologies for that. I think we should uh, move, we should go ahead and uh, Marcin Grabowski, if you want to raise a question, I would invite you to uh, put it in the chat and we can take it for the next, uh, after the next speaker. Okay, so let's, uh, let's go ahead. I would like to introduce Monica Yatan. So Monica is a team leader for uh, agri-environmental indicators and crop statistics in Eurostat. And she's currently involved in implementing a new legal framework for agricultural statistics, input and output. Monica has been working in Eurostat over the last seven years previously with statistics on macroeconomic indicators. And before joining the European Commission, Monica have worked in the public administration in Romania, which is the Ministry of European Integration, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And she has also gained experience in the private sector. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Agnes, for the introduction. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting Eurostat to this uh 
to this discussion. It's very interesting to see all the data sharing initiatives that are in Europe. I think my presentation is going to be rather on the input with a possible input that could go into these uh, initiatives. And um, please don't hesitate to ask questions. Now I'm trying to share my screen. Let me know if it works. Yes, it works. Very I good. just need to hide. Okay. So my presentation is going to be about this new legal framework that we're working on, the statistic, uh, statistics on agricultural input and output, and also about an initiative on environmental accounting that Eurostat has. And uh, I'm going to try to show a bit how this could possibly help with the discussion on uh, pollinators. I'm going to start with uh, environmental accounts to explain a bit what they are about and what this new legal initiative on ecosystems is about. And then I'm gonna move to my field of expertise and what I'm working on at the moment, which is statistics on agricultural input and output. And here I'm gonna concentrate specifically on the plant protection products and how this new legal initiative is gonna change the way the data is available for uh, for the pesticides as we know them uh, in common language. But I'm gonna start first, as I said, with the uh, environmental accounts uh, in Eurostat and the new legal initiative on ecosystems accounts. So um, we have uh, environmental uh, statistics uh, in Eurostat for quite some years and environmental economic accounts starting with 2011. There is a specific regulation that you see on your screen right now with 691, which establishes that member states have the legal obligation to calculate and report six accounts. Uh, they are about environmental taxes, green sector, environmental investments, material flows, energy flows, and air emissions. So um, up until now, it was the, the environmental accounting that was published by Eurostat, which contained all these um, silos, let's call them, to give a bit of a, of a view in how accounting in this very delicate sector is taking place. Now, the Commission is proposing an amendment to this regulation to extend the scope of the regulation with three new accounts. Uh, these are ecosystem accounts on which I will briefly present uh, um, what the initiative is about, forest accounts and environmental subsidies at national level. Um, so about ecosystem accounts, um, the slides are about this part because one part of um, these ecosystems is about pollination. The legal amendment is currently in trialogues with the Council and the European Parliament, um, but the discussions are quite advanced. So Eurostat is really hoping that it's going to pass the trialogues and uh, we're going to have also these three accounts um, available for, for the public in, in the coming years. Now, to understand ecosystem accounts and what we are looking for to receive from the countries, we are talking here about three layers of information. So we have the ecosystem extent account, which talks about the surface covered by the ecosystems, the total surface of the country is covered here, so also urban areas. We have what we call an ecosystem condition accounting, which measures the health condition of the ecosystems and is related to degradation or pollution, for example. And then on top, it's the ecosystem services accounting. And here we look to measure the benefits of the ecosystems for society. Um, and there are several uh, ecosystem services that Eurostat uh, is giving priority to, and pollination is one of them. Uh, the next slide is about this part. 
but other services are about global climate regulation, air filtration, for example. So really the top layer of what we call services on top of the surface um, and the health of the service. Now about ecosystem services, as I said, um, Eurostat is considering after discussing with the member states that there are seven ecosystem services and one of them is about pollination. And you see here the definition that was chosen for this service, uh, which is the ecosystem contribution by wild pollinators to the production of the crops. This contribution will be reported to Eurostat in tons of pollinator dependent crops that can be attributed to wild pollinators by type of crop for the main types of pollinator dependent crops comprising fruit trees, berries, tomatoes, all seeds and others. Um, data will be reported in the supply and use tables um, like it is in national accounts. So kind of an input and output table and um, if this uh, presentation is going to be circulated to the participants here, you have, uh, you have a link to the compilation guidelines for this type of data. They're, it's a non-final draft, but still you can have an idea how they look like. Um, for the moment, the commission is proposing that the first reporting year is 2026 with a reference year 2024, but this date has uh, is still under uh, negotiation, so it can be that uh, it's going to be later. But uh, Eurostat has proposed this as an entry in uh, in the negotiation start. And again, I hope the presentation can be circulated because there are a lot of uh, there is a lot of information on Eurostat site here on top of the guidelines that were on the previous slide. And now to move forward, I'm going to present the other legal initiative, which is on statistics on agricultural input and output. And here, um, okay, the legal framework it's quite wide, but I'm gonna um, I'm gonna concentrate mainly on the plant protection uh, products, so pesticides as we know them. Um, and to to show you a bit how this legal um, act is going to improve the data availability on pesticides. And to show that, I'm going to talk a bit about how the current statistics on the Eurostat public database look like. Uh, maybe some of you are already familiar with that. So currently, Eurostat is publishing two tables on pesticides. One is on sales and one is on use. The regulation that we are based on and that gives us the possibility to collect data from the member states is 1185 on pesticide statistics. It's a regulation which has links with the SANTE regulations. And this regulation uh, obliges Eurostat to aggregate the data before publishing it on the website. This means that even if we receive the data from the member states at active substance level, we can only publish um, we can only publish the data aggregated by the intermediary aggregates above the active substance level. So what we're publishing annually for pesticide sales is kilogram of total sales by major groups, categories of products, and chemical classes. And this is uh, this has been quite a um, complaint that we have received many times that the um, the active substance basic level is not available, uh, is not available because of legal constraints, uh, and it applies also to the table on PPP use in agriculture, which is a five-year data collection, and here again all the quantities and the treated hectares are aggregated. Um, on top of this, what we now receive um, on pesticides in agriculture from the member states is data for at least one crop and one year during the five-year period. And the crop or the crops and the year or the years are at the own choice of the member states. So um, the table is not quite... Um, usable. It has a lot of empty spaces due to this uh, requirement. So overall, the data on PPP use at the moment is not very comparable or usable. 
Now, what SIO has introduced, uh, the regulation regarding the um, statistics on agricultural input and output has been published. Uh, you have the number here is 2379 published last year. And for pesticide statistics, uh, the sales data will continue annually, just like it is now, starting from 2025. The major changes are the pesticide use data, because it's going to be annual starting from reference year 2028. And we're going to have a transitional period, 2025-2027. Um, where there's going to be a data collection for reference year 2026 for all the member states. So it's going to be the first year where we're going to have data from all member states for the same reference period. Again, we are quite linked with the um, um, with the legislation from Digisante and what um, they put in the regulations as a list of active substances approved or non-approved. Um, but this is the case uh, even now. Now, um, what is the coverage of this data or what it will be under SIO? For 2026, so when all member states are obliged to send data for PPP use, we have devised a common list of crops for all member states um, to have comparable data again for the first time. And this common list of crops together with the permanent grasslands at EU level will cover 75% of the utilized agricultural area in uh, EU. And from 2020 on onwards, when the data becomes annual also for PPP use, the data also needs to cover at least 85% of the PPP use in the agricultural activity in each member state. So, um, the data will, com will come on this common list of crops that we have devised, and then each member states will have to supplement that list of crops with other crops in such a way that they cover the 85% of the PPP use. And on top of that, as soon as there is EU legislation that requires the professional users of pesticides to transmit their records, uh, to the national competent authorities, we are allowed to increase uh, the request for coverage on the use in agriculture to 95%. Now, there is also, we also have in the meantime, the implementing regulation for the transitional period, which is 2025-2027. The link uh, is here. It has been published in July, and all the technical details are contained there. But on the next slide, I'm also going to show that. Um, and for 2020 on 2028 onwards, uh, there's going to be a new implementing regulation. We're going to start working on it in 2024 to see how we can ensure this coverage of 85% at national level. And uh, compared with how the data is published right now, the data will be available at active substance level for both sales and use. So SIO has eliminated this request that Eurostat aggregates the data before um, is publishing it. So researchers or decision makers will be able to see for the first time, statistics at EU level, which show the active substance, um, I mean, the basic chemical substances. The data will be at national level data, and um, the reference period will be the calendar year. The calendar year for the, for the data on sales. For the data on news, which is of most interest for all the stakeholders from the discussions that uh, we have until now, um, for the transitional period, so 2025, 2026, and 2027, as I said, the data will be collected for 2026 only by all the member states. The reference period is the harvest year, so not the calendar year, but the harvest year, which means that the countries need to transmit to us um, the quantities of pesticides which are applied on the crops from the um, sowing phase of the crop until the, um, the crop has been harvested, which might be in some cases longer than the calendar year. And you see here the, um, the list of 21 crops which have been chosen for the transitional period. 
We are also requesting data for the organic crops and the non-organic um, crops areas, let's say. And of course, the member states, if they so wish, they can send the data for other crops on a voluntary basis. For the organic um, areas, um, this data will be collected for the first time. And when we say organic, we mean both the certified organic areas or the ones which are under conversion to organic. We also have introduced in the legal act, and this is quite important, um, a requirement to avoid the double counting of treated areas because um, you can have several active substances which are applied on the same area or on the same crop, but at different periods. The idea is not to count that area every time um, it has been treated, but to count it only once and to to sum up just the active substances um, which have been sprayed or, or applied. And this is a bit of the timeline for the SIO-based data collection for the pesticide sales and for the pesticide use. And you see here a bit the differences because um, as I said, for sales, um, the data already now is annual, uh, collected annually and published annually, and it will continue to be like that. Under the SIO framework, the first reference year is going to be 2025. The reference period remains calendar year um, the deadline to transmit the data under SIO will be end of December 2026, and we expect to publish it somewhere in Q2 2027. Whereas for PPPUs, uh, the first reference year under SIO will be 2026 for the harvest year of 2026. Um, the deadline again is one year later usually, so 31 December 2027, and we expect to publish this data for the first time in Q2 2028. Again, there are links here both to our articles on consumption of pesticides, but also to the Eurostat website um, on agriculture and or on the methodology on different agri-environmental indicators. There's a lot of information. I also put here our functional mailbox. So if there are any questions after this presentation, you can also um, contact us uh, there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Monica. That was very uh, inspiring. Yes, um, thank you. We have a question, but before I just want to uh, clarify that uh, all the, the recording will be available through the uh, EU Pollinator Week website and also the, the presentations. We have a question from uh, Mara Kazaku. I hope I pronounced the, the name correctly. Uh, apologies if this is not the case. Who exactly will report on the use of pesticides, the farmers themselves? And if so, how will you ensure the data will be accurate? So uh, uh, even currently, the regulations in place require that professional users of pesticides keep records of what they have used on the crops. This is a legal requirement. And normally it should be checked at national level by the competent authorities. It, this has to be done. Now, starting with 2026, there's going to be electronic registers um, for the farmers. So they will have to input the data electronically. Um, how you ensure that it's correct? Well, usually the professional users of pesticides is somebody who is quite well trained. Otherwise, they wouldn't be allowed to, to put that. Uh, it's also in their interest because they are um, controlled on this. Uh, of course, there is a list of um, active substances, so we cannot introduce anything else other than that. I mean, there are checks which are implicit uh, in the filling of the registers, and it's the national authorities usually which take care that the registers are filled, um, are filled accordingly and they do the controls that uh, they can. At Eurostat level, we have other types of uh, checks, which are coherence between uh, the data that is sent to us. Um, we check that the aggregations are correct. I mean, there are there are a lot of checks. Of course, there can always be errors, but these are 
unavoidable. Thank you, Monica. I don't think we have uh, any more questions in the chat. So we have, yes, you, uh, Noah, you want to say something, please? Yes, I wanted to ask uh, Monica, well, actually, to, also to make a statement. We are we are very happy actually that the efforts in the SIO um, are there because they already we already observe a big uh, some diversity in the way the regions and the member states collect uh, the same crops. <laughs> so this is going to be already a very nice exercise to harmonize just the names of the crops. That will be even very good. Yeah. So that's very nice. But my question is about the detail of the data that uh, that will be published that will be will be available. Um, so what's uh, the, in terms of the level of aggregation, uh, how will it be public, published? Uh, like what will be the, um, the more detailed geo reference and time? You know, in reference uh, in geographical terms and in time wise? So in, in time, in time um, so the reference period is always a year. For sales, it's the, calendar year how much um how how many kilograms or tons of pesticides have been placed on the market in a member state in a calendar year um for use under sio it will be the harvest year so again you will see one figure per year per crop per active substance etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, but it's the year nothing else uh, and the regional level will be national uh, because this is how it was, uh, SIO was negotiated. So we're not going to NATS 2 level or NATS 3 level. Um, the, but at, the... at, one point, at one point, it was uh, going much further, no? Yeah, I, I think it was the NATS, negotiations. NATS yeah, ah, okay. but you negotiate. always have negotiations with the council, with the parliament, and uh, yes, it's, uh, the pesticides was quite a topic in the negotiations, I have to say. And um, for a lot of the countries, uh, pesticides use since they choose just one year now or one crop that they send to us because uh, the regulation allows them to do, to jump from that to a list of 21, which is obligatory, to that reference year, which is obligatory for everyone. It's quite a jump in their uh, statistical uh, systems. I mean, this is not raw data. This is statistics. They have to ensure a level of quality, otherwise they are breaching the regulations. So um, in the negotiations, it was, uh, we stayed at the national level. Even if for, for other SIO data sets, we, we go at not to level, indeed. Okay, thank you. Maybe in the future, yes. We have another question in the chat and I would like to have at least two minutes left. So we have three minutes left. I, maybe you can answer, uh, Monica. Yes, yes. The, the, answer, so, the, the answer to Iveta is yes. Yes, no. the, the registers, um, the way it has to be um, registered comes from a regulation of Digisante and the level of detail is very high. So they have to say which crop at which stage of the growth of the crop, the substance was applied, what substance, in what quantity, on what area, etc. I mean, the level of detail is very, very high and uh, very chemical also, let's say. So... Thank you, Monica. So I think it's uh, time to, to wrap up. And um, rather than taking the floor, I would like to give you the opportunity, each of the speaker, to have a, a final word on, you know, how do you take that further? Listening to uh, the three speakers, well, to the two speakers, <laughs> how do you envisage the future? How do you see uh, the interaction between these uh, three initiatives um, working so what would be your uh, concluding uh, words so please uh, monica for us it's always extremely interesting to get in touch with people who really use our data because um, sometimes we get caught in um, our statistics here and we are kind of in a bubble between statisticians and we we rarely we rarely are invited to places where we really see how the data is used. Because if you don't see how the data is used, then it's very difficult to do your regulations or to see what are the real needs. So okay. for me, really, thank you very much for inviting me because it gives me the perspective of the usage. 
of the Thank data. Thank you, Monica. And Sarah, would you like to say a few words? Yeah, indeed. So thank you also from my side, because from, from my perspective on the other side, it's very interesting to understand, I mean, all this evolution in terms of new data that are going to be available. And again, so this is, a, let's say, a specific community, but there is a, another world outside this, and they would benefit a lot from all this data that you are making available and also the, the simulations that you are doing. So I I can really see a lot of interaction in the future and you can bring a really good contribution to, to EOSC and to our overall objective of cross interdisciplinarity. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you very much, Sarah. And Noah, just a few words because it's time. Mm -hmm. Yes. No, so well, certainly I learned that now I'm going to contact directly Sarah to see if it's forward. Uh, so the next steps uh, to, to give another dimension uh, precisely to the European uh, Pollinator Hub. And of course, I was very happy to hear about uh, what Monica presented because we are eager users of uh, Eurostat data, just a little bit frustrated. So we very we know very well the, the data that is there because we use it and uh, it's just frustrated that the, the level of accuracy, <laughs> not accuracy, the level of detail is not uh, very pertinent for us, let's say, because we are, of course, uh, looking forward to, to have data expressed as the, even at a postal code level. <laughs> but yeah, so we are definitely um, in charge, let's say, in contact with all these uh, data initiatives and uh, trying to contribute as much as possible to Okay, so thank you very much uh, to all of you, and in particular to the three of you. And uh, with that, uh, we need to uh, to stop because time is over. So thank you very much for all your um, presentation and enriching uh, discussion. Goodbye. Thank you, Anis. Thank you, Agnes. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.